Welcome back, everyone, to Stories of D4's Footnotes. I'm really excited to have you and to have our dear friend Connor here this week. Yeah. Connor, are you glad to be back? Oh, yeah, of course. Gosh, course last, so. I think you were a much weaker player character when we last met. Yeah. I don't think we leveled up yet. It's literally on my ass, actually. <laughs> you are. You yeah. are. We still, still have. Still am, actually, yeah. Uh, for those of you who tuned in this week to see session 12 here in Elts, uh, our dear Thorn is currently prone with somewhere between 5 and 12 hit points after being revived. 6, I think, yeah. 6? Ooh! <laughs> Lower end of that spectrum, then. Yeah. And I'm desperately trying to remember what my next turn is going to be, so I've written down everything I'm doing. For two weeks, uh, this battle mat, which is just off camera here, is going to be haunting Victoria's day and night. I'm going to have to walk by it. Try not to stare at it all, you know, like, okay, am I sure that I made the right decisions? You know, for two weeks. You can run, you can hide, but the battle still awaits. Uh, anywho, getting into kind of today, I don't think we have any major announcements. Uh, we don't have a session this upcoming week, but you'll be joining us the week after Thanksgiving, that Friday, for our exciting session 13. Ooh, lucky number. You know... Uh, I want to kind of talk about this last session before we just kind of get into general D&D topics. Mm -hmm. I think there was some really great stuff that ended up happening. At the start of the session, you all had traveled to that apartment in the docks. Mm -hmm. You had discovered that it was quite dangerous and it harmed Hoot. You even traveled back in the morning to get a little bit more information. But both times, you actually pulled back. You took... You, you took some time, analyzed the situation, and decided we shouldn't fight this right now. Yeah. And uh, a, a lot of DMs that I've seen talking online have talked about this general idea that getting player characters to run away, or even more in our case, to not simply let's roll face over this encounter, let's charge in, see what we can do, is a bit of a challenge, uh, especially with newer players. You guys have played for a couple years. Yeah. What? So I guess I want to know a little bit specifically what made you all decide not to not to take on that this most recent time, but also what kind of makes you want to backpedal out of an encounter or run away? What are your warning signs? I feel like the the first part is pretty easy because it was broad daylight. And yeah, the second time around, that was yeah. easier. We're just, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, like we're gonna go bust Se in yeah, somewhere. Describing yeah. the guards walking by on the main road helped. Yeah. Yeah, the first time was because the alarm was going off in the room, and yeah. it was the room that we had all of our stuff in, so that's okay. why we went back. Yeah. Um, Though I'd say, even if the alarm didn't go off, I don't know if we would have left, but I think that there's a possibility we could have, because we knew that we had some missing resources in the party. And L was completely depleted that first time. From a meta level, that's never a fun way to go into what feels like an optional encounter, right? It's not optional because we're going back, oh, but... everything is optional. Well, everything's optional, but it's not optional for us. We, we choose to go back. We want to do it again. <laughs> but the, the calculus of we've got, this, uh, we've got this encounter sitting in front of us. It's already been sitting here for a few days, and it doesn't seem to have had anything happen to it. And then we have a friend who has no resources... <laughs> kind of makes it like, I don't know if I really want to do this right now. Again, the alarm was great impetus to run away too, because we could have just said, Yosef will handle it. And yeah. the it's alarms good... will do their job. Yeah, it's a good motivator, I guess, to not do that. Yeah. And then or a also... good excuse. <laughs> and then also, like, we show up, and one of my familiars immediately, immediately gets popped. Like, you yeah. know, just staring at it. I failed that save, so I wasn't doing great either. Yeah, yeah we knew it was another painting, so it was going to be another round of us mm -hmm. smacking each other so we can snap out of it. Right. So we, we going into it, we already knew this is going to be rough for L specifically. And then I've already gone into this with one less resource than I planned on. I don't really know how mm -hmm. to not have that happen if we go back in there. My familiars are just going to have to make that save again. So there are there are a few options there, and you might mm -hmm. during the next session there might be some intelligence and knowledge based checks that may be, mm -hmm. uh, be able to assist you there. I'm just gonna get octopus familiars and just you know, hoot and chirp are gonna be octopi. <laughs> Squid. Yeah. Um, that, that's know, the solution. Uh, one thing that I don't actually have in my note I, I don't have in my notes here, but I realized I promised during session is you all had asked about that, that the alarm bells, the Yosef encounter. What if we hadn't gone back? Yeah. And something that I thought, if, and especially we'd love to hear from you all if, uh, if this is something that you're interested in, something I thought might be fun here for footnotes is kind of talking about those what ifs. Yeah. Um, you haven't. <laughs> I'm going to crib Marvel here. What if? 
Yeah. Uh, we have to find another way to ask that question. Yeah, they're definitely the first ones to do it. They're the first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is true. Uh, Disney Disney Marvel's the first people yeah. to, of course. Simpsons never did it. Yeah, or so, no. just about those two Simpsons words. Simpsons has never done anything. No, no. Just about those two <gasps> words in order next to each other. Jayhawk is in chat. Yay! Hi, Jason. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Yosef? Uh, should, so I actually rolled out the encounter, and I had this round base, and your successes determined what round, effectively, of that altercation you arrived. We did a little bit of, you know, wibbly-wobbly with how long transit time, but that honestly, without doing that, that would have meant there was no chance for you to intervene fully outside of player hands, which is not mm -hmm. really my preferred DMing style. It also, to a degree, defeats the purpose of setting the alarm. If... If it's a mile away and you can't do anything about it. What's, what's the point of responding? Now, I will say, I'll, to, to respond to that before we talk about what happened with Yosef, there are instances where your alarm can go off, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So to give an example, if let's say Yosef hadn't been there and someone walked in, picked up a bucket, a uh, bucket, a barrel and left. Right. Absolutely. You would have shown up, known when someone was there, Maybe you could have used that information for an investigation check with Okta. Yeah, or just, you know, the general, like, hey, here's some money, tell us who passed through kind of thing, you know, but maybe not necessarily who exactly. Yeah, were there any particularly thievy looking people that walked in recently? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, after I described the leader of those, the, well, I, the, I, I guess I didn't state this, but the one who was still conscious was much more powerful than the other one. Mm -hmm. He was pretty thievy looking. Yeah. He was yeah. wearing layers of robes and cloth. Uh, we have a great suggestion from the chat here for El Stormio, but suppose if. Alternatively, say for the sake of argument. For the sake of argument. For the sake of argument. Let's just let's just use that for the now. The Capilar Caravan does not return. And in that encounter, a couple things happen. Yosef rolls a natural 20. <gasps> oh. Hi, McKinley. We're super <laughs> glad to have you. Um, McKinley, absolutely wonderful. And a former player here at our table. Uh, they're having a great time. And My table. We're going to send them like, all <laughs> kinds of congratulations. Oh, yeah. With Yosef, Yosef did roll a natural 20 with his crossbow. Oh, wow. The, not a very powerful... Uh, the, the secondary person was a, was a regular bandit. So yeah. took out one guard, uh, one bandit rather. Uh, but in the instance where he failed, they weren't there to murder Yosef, and so he would have been hurt and left unconscious but not dying. However, from a, uh, a thievery point of view, your mithril and your cold iron would have been stolen, and you would have had to seek out those vipers yourself. Well, I don't like Yosef getting injured either, because we're kind of like, hey, buddy. There's a social encounter, too, that you, you bypassed of convincing him to stay after he got beaten the first night back in the city. Yeah, because, yeah, it's scary, and I wouldn't have, you know, I would have been like, hey, man, if you want to leave, that's fine. You know, you don't have to stay under our employee. Sure. It's freaking you out. But I'm glad that we were able to kind of step in. Absolutely. Instead of him thinking, you all are a danger to me, your result, Yosef might think Elilia Arendral is the biggest badass this side of, uh, <laughs> this side of the runehold. Yeah. Like, you all... You all showed up. Yosef has extreme great, uh, extreme thanks for all of you, but Gwynwin and Alilie were there so soon mm -hmm. that he was able to directly see the person who was hurting me. They stopped it immediately. Yeah. Um, so mad props to the whole party. Oh yeah, that was a fun encounter. Um, we didn't even we didn't even show up in time, but yeah. it was still a fun encounter to be there. For, like, that's the thing too. You don't have to be involved in every encounter for the encounters to be fun. Right. But you should be involved in nearly all of right, them. Right, right, right. But I know that there's going to be times, especially whenever we split the party, which we did, where you're not. Once you split the party, all bets are off. Like you're not going to be involved in everything okay. because of it. That's a fair trade. And yeah. we. Players like to split the party for some reason. I don't understand the psychology behind it, but I do it whenever I'm a player, and I dread it whenever I'm a DM. Um. <laughs> it, I've, when, in my in our pre-campaign survey, every single player described enjoying splitting the party. Right. It's, uh, it seems that for the players, they're having a great time. Mm -hmm. And well, we have these like crack teams of like specialists. So like you may have like you know that you want to send your sneakiest people in first, and then you want to have your beaters somewhere else. Send the three people with high end to the library. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what you do. This and guy can't read. <laughs> the nerds go to the library. <laughs> you go question people. Yeah. I don't know. At the I bar. Try to get deals. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it. you're the the party right you now. You have an effective face. We'll put it that way. I don't believe anyone has a negative charisma score. 
No. And I, so. as such, now I, I have to double check on Gwynwyn. I think she might be a 10 or 12. I think she's just fine. Mm -hmm. The whole party can participate in social encounters. And I think yeah. that as a campaign, that actually adds a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and we also use a lot of non-charisma skills in social encounters. Yeah, and that's the thing about, again, you go from one campaign to another and you have people who've played certain roles in the past. Um, having somebody else play the face is so interesting to me, <laughs> so much fun. Because um, we did that we did that intermediate health campaign, the, which was great, but like trying to transition out of being like, I'm gonna go talk to the barkeep is definitely as a player, one of those little yeah. sticking points where it's like, I know that it's not my time to shine. I need to let that person step forward after doing it for three years. Yeah, oh, especially yeah. with the, the Guardians campaign. That's yeah. like, you were the face as well. I was the face there. And then we, we, had, we had somebody who could be a face, but he was like nervous about doing it. So it's like, I'm gonna back you up. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that help action as much as possible. So you yeah. step forward and be the face. And so it's, it's I love being a face. It's so much fun. I, it it really is. It's also great to have. Well, everyone should be able to participate. And we're gonna mm -hmm. see. I can't wait to see Gwyn win talking shop with another alchemist. I can't yeah. wait to see Ismini and L discussing eldritch and arcane lore. But it is also great. You you can lie. You can persuade. Heck, you can intimidate pretty well too. Is Mimi can only lie. That's the only <laughs> that thing fits. she that, <laughs> that absolutely she can do. Attracts. Um, kind of transitioning a little bit with our uh, with our last that last encounter in Orktown, where you you went to the, kind of the seedy portion of Orktown. Orktown yeah. has positive elements. You were tracking an active criminal who's probably not a great guy. Yeah. Who went somewhere that was pretty rough and hurt the people who were there, but. A couple things I want to mention about that. That is an that was a very high challenge encounter. The hill giant is mostly basic. He's a challenge rating five creature. Already a reasonable challenge. But that knight you encountered was considerably stronger than the CR35. Probably like fighting a pair of CR5 creatures. Yeah. And there's five fourth level characters here. So this is a solid... You've spent resources. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of get into... Lilier's finisher and what it kind of means. <laughs> yeah. Um, because Jake actually asked a really great question last session. So for those of you who may not remember, or if you haven't checked out session 12, Jake had asked about disarming and what it takes to take a weapon away from an active combatant. And it was one of the few times, it might have even been the first time in this campaign, where it was a very definitive, no, you can't, in this situation. It was yeah. definitely a few times. I've never really tried to do it in a campaign that I've that I can think of. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But there are a lot of, um, I guess not a lot, but there are some classes mm -hmm. or subclasses that give you the ability to not be disarmed. The so, most significant battle master has a maneuver for disarming right. strike. Yeah. And like for me, I played an Eldritch Knight. Eldritch Knights have a specific, um, what do you call it, class feature at a certain level where you can't be disarmed. Mm -hmm. And until you had that, especially once you had when you had the ability to return your weapon right, to your weapon hand, bond, yeah. uh, what was kind of fun was that having you narratively be disarmed. So before you were in combat, because mm -hmm. disarming you in combat was quite difficult. Right. So that you could use that feature, yeah. that that worked. You handed over your weapon, like, oh yeah. Yeah, I'll... I used to do it willingly all you the time. You sold, <laughs> yeah. sold your weapon and then just, once you're out of the village, yeah. teleport it yeah. back. Right. But it was more like the bad guys are like, okay, we're gonna take all your weapons now, so I'm gonna take your, I don't know, loot, and I'm gonna take and your Connor is sword. never unarmed. And Connor yes. never unarmed. Yeah. You can't put him in a jail cell. He's gonna get it back. But so, <laughs> yeah. and I, I wanted and I wanted to get, uh, we had some questions actually with some folks that were on the Discord about Oh, sorry, I just remember the time where you were like underwater and you were like literally trying to save my character, let like, go oh, your weapon, and then snapped back at the end of all that. That was, oh, yeah. uh, that was one of my favorite little, like, yeah. Connor of course, plays you good saved, heroes. You saved me, so of course I love that moment. But it was <laughs> it was one of those, like, that's a really cool feature. Um, Jason's character, uh, Kulasino, also had the ability to return his weapon, which was quite useful as a hex blade. Oh, yeah. But so I want to kind of address something. I had a great question from one of our friends over on the Discord about how we I said no to disarming without a class feature, mm -hmm. but we also had Alilier cut the hand off of the knight at the finish. Yeah. And I think there was a very big, there's a very important distinction between those two. And I want to go through some cases if you're okay with that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I kind of already 
have an idea of why that worked in this this sense. Sure, and and if you want to explain, I'm certain you're correct yeah. here. He was going to go down anyway. He was at zero hit. He was points. at zero hit points. Why not flavor it as a disarm? Makes it more fun. That was a real disarm. And it was a natural twenty. Yes. Exactly. On that. Exactly. That was yeah. a big part of it to me. Um, if she had similarly said, I want to leave a big scar on his face, mm -hmm. or I want to permanently damage his armor, I would have, you know, maybe there would have been some extra rolls if it was a little too much. But those sort of things, that rewards an already done deal and makes it a little more memorable. Right. With called shots, uh, for those of you who may not know, not just disarming, but things like I want to go for his eyes or strike him in the legs to slow him down, those sort of things are certainly very fun um, and at some tables, this works uh, with the GM. Mm -hmm. Now, we haven't been using called shots as a general rule because there are a couple ways you can do it. Because rules is written, there's no options for this. If you unless. Wanna, unless. Right. You have but, but for everybody else, no. And so, right. Assuming you don't have features, the two main ways you could resolve this, as you would with anything in 5th edition, are with attack rolls and saving throws. Yeah. So with an attack roll, if you were already swinging your sword at them, Maybe you give a disadvantage to them. But even in our game, we've already at fourth level had cases where you've had three sources of advantage. Yeah. And so using the advantage-disadvantage system isn't necessarily a sufficient penalty. I've seen even further things like disadvantage versus a plus five to their armor class. And mm -hmm. even so, mm -hmm. that sort of thing ends up being, why would you not use this system Correct. constantly? And why wouldn't the monsters go to permanently... Permanently blinding a, blinding a player is so different than them permanently applying, uh, blinding an NPC. Right. Right. Though I think we should always consider it being... It is not the same, but I like to think of it... I don't know, maybe it's just my emotional, like, I care for all the NPCs, but, like, I always think of it the same way as, like, man, this, good. Is a, this is a person that I'm blinding. Like, I feel a little guilty about that. Yeah. I, we I mean, do want that. Right. Yeah, and there are specifically spells that cause these conditions on yeah. NPCs. Yeah. So giving a martial character that ability for to free. just do for free mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, that's a big bump in a power level. One thing I could, oh, I was going to say, because fighters have the ability to do some level of called shots, mm -hmm. and then Gunslinger, the, yeah. uh, the... Pathfinder. And then also just uh, the um, the Matthew Mercer, oh, yeah. the Matthew Mercer yeah. Gunslinger for Fifth Edition, which is based on that, is also got the, the, the grit and the, uh, the called shot kind of mm -hmm. mechanic, and it kind of rolls into that question that we've had sometimes, where hey, can I sneakily cast a spell? Well, we have the sorcerer at the table who has to pay for that. Right. So you can't just give it to players it's for resource, free. Yeah, yeah. Right. so it's, it's one of those other things. Is This is something that costs a player an investment into a class and into a subclass to get. Right. And with um, one thing I have considered mm -hmm. is there may be cases where we find exceptions uh, and edge cases. So it won't always be hard and fast. We've used in the past, uh, on previous campaigns, high enough level spell casters trying to do something slightly outside of a spell's description, spending additional spell slots. Maybe yeah. a battle master using a maneuver not quite as written, giving me additional superiority dice. Mm -hmm. When players start putting resources on the table, I think, at least in our table... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, I, yeah, I did see. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, they're little wooden coasters. Once resources are on the table, um, either long rest, short rest, or even permanent resources, those sort of exceptions to the rule can add to gameplay mm -hmm. for us. Um, but again, those are all things you really want to attune to your specific group. Right, yeah. And kind of read the room, too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> See how the other players feel about it happening, if you're the DM. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you're playing at a table where there's no battle masters or gunslingers and you want to do cold shots... Yeah. It's not It's not the worst thing in the world. Right. You, you could absolutely make it work. Uh, we actually... Ooh, can I talk about what, what Stories to D4 almost was? Sure. We previously, before we actually started the channel, we had already plan started planning to run this campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, the players only knew the vague description. We talked about what we wanted to do, what we liked, what we didn't. But one part of that process, when we initially were considering it being a home game rather than an online game, were a little bit more breadth to the table and house rules that we're using. One such rule was the banning of the Battlemaster subclass, not because it was overpowered or unfun, but actually as an expansion to martial characters. Mm -hmm. 
This is not something that I'm claiming is play tested or balanced. This was something that was going to be done in a home game with specifically a group that would have enjoyed it. Basically making it so that Battlemaster maneuvers and superiority dice were things that martial characters could do. Um, yeah, and I think that would be... Personally, if that were the option, I would definitely play a marshal because I'd yeah. want to test it out. Because I've played a battle master before. It wasn't a very long campaign, but I got the chance to play a battle master, and it was a lot of fun. That was my first real marshal experience, other than a cleric. Jake actually points out an excellent, uh, makes an excellent point in the chat. Isn't there a feat for that? There actually is a feat brought to us, I believe, in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, that allows players to take uh, to gain a d6 superiority dice or an additional, if they already had superiority dice, and learn two maneuvers. Mm -hmm. One such thing that I thought as a balanced version of the original table rule, and I guess I can reveal that to you here on the on footnotes, is that there are advanced martial trainers, powerful heroes, mercenary leaders, maybe even members of the military, who, would you just, were you to spend enough downtime, can grant you certain feats, feats relating to training. Mm -hmm. This feat is one such option to allow players, um, without investing one of their precious ASIs, right. to gain a feat. Because yeah. a feat's a big. I, I know. Will can... end much strong. This campaign will end with much stronger player characters than rules is written. Yeah, because I was gonna say it is already a big investment to choose your class around getting these things. Like, oh, I want to pick a fighter battle master so I can do these kind of like yes. shots and these defensive moves and that bait and switch thing that Jake does, which is so cool. But a feat for oh. anybody is they're so precious. Yeah, and fighters get more of them than any Did other we? class. That's so. true. Now, I don't believe our character cards that are normally on the bottom left card, uh, corner mention the feats that we currently have. They, we don't have feats on there yet. So one interesting thing I don't know if has expressly been stated yet, and if it has, well, you get a little bit of a recap here on today's footnotes. We actually have all of our players starting with a free feat. Mm -hmm. This lets our players, it, it gets a little bit more of that personality going mm -hmm. there. It's certainly not a requirement to have fun in fifth edition by any means, but all of you have Every time I've brought up the question, it has been a unanimous request. Yes, let's keep using that rule. Yeah. yeah. It's how I have both, it's how I was a second level character casting a second level spell, <laughs> you know? Uh, yes, you have <laughs> access to two feats. Yeah. Which, which, variant human. Variant yeah. human plus I the three like feet. It allows you to kind of flavor your, your class a little, your, that you're choosing a little more. Mm -hmm. Gives you a little more um, like customization. And we did have some limits on that uh, fla uh, the background feat we actually talked about there were a couple of feats we did not allow for players to take for free as that with using our optional table rule as in, as you discussed before chef because it's broken <laughs> okay we'll get <laughs> sorry we'll get the chef I think we need Jake here for yeah. chef that's why I mentioned it because I know yeah. he's in chat and so for example the great weapon master feat was one that we specifically mentioned as this is very good. You could get it if you're a variant human because you're investing your racial selection in that. Or you could get it via leveling up because it was so powerful. Not banned at our table by any means, but all of the free feats everyone took were related to their background story. Mm -hmm. So you, so is Meanie Callister receiving her Fae Touched Fae Touched. Because of her relation with the Elven House of Summer and maybe some magical modifications going on behind the scenes. Uh, your starting feat from... from Tasha's telekinetic. Telekinetic yeah. is relating to the strange powers that you seem to have recently... Uh, we've mentioned you've recently obtained... Uh, Very recently. You're, you, uh, two months ago, you were not a combatant. You had four hit points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and I feel like I still do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah last session I felt like I had four hit points. <laughs> yeah, you. we did realize after the fact, uh, maybe it was on camera, maybe it wasn't, that it was actually slightly less damage than it should have been. It should have been 47 instead of 37. Either way, one shot. One shot. Yeah. Uh, or I guess two shots because it was two attacks. It was a crit and an, uh, an actual hit as well. Those sort of things will really take you down. Yeah. That would have taken down uh, Silas if he was if he was you know relatively injured as well. Yeah, for sure. It would have got me too, even through that ward, which again, it's so hard because we try to be very strategic in how we play you, together. You did an excellent job last it's, session. I think that that's some of the fun for our table is trying to figure out, okay, like what's the best thing we could do like with this party that we have right now? Who goes where? What order are we in? You know, once we get into combat, that's the initiative roles going to decide some of that. But trying to like 
work together. So I let's make our fast people and our hard hitter people like let's protect them and do what we can for them without getting us uh, squishies yeah, hit as them, often. Let them focus on the big bad. We'll take care of the little guys. Yeah, that's why I was like, in the thing, yeah. if it wasn't for the fact that guy hit L, I was gonna just start hitting that hill giant and just only focus on the hill giant. I, I have a. It's the only reason why I hit the big the the knight. I have to say, there's been a, uh, an ability used that has felt consistently, maybe maybe the MVP, or certainly up there, mm -hmm. Jake's character Silas has a switch move mm -hmm. that he can use so that he can reposition, and that ability has changed how battles have gone entirely. Mm -hmm. It gives people, essentially, it's kind of like him spending a superior order die to give someone a free disengage action. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Already reasonable. And then he gets to buff either his AC or their AC. Right, and uh, it's based on the size of his superiority dice. Yeah. So been... One day that'll be a 12. Yeah, so he's been rolling that, and that's been... Yeah, he rolled a 1 last session, but it's yeah. still... An extra 1 to AC is something that we pay gold for. Oh, for sure. You know, like a, a lot, lot of, of gold, gold for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I really like the flavor of that entire ability, because the increase in AC is pretty easy to think. For himself, a defensive stand, or for his friend, it's literally he's interposing with his big shield. Mm -hmm. And so it really has been killing it. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm excited to see how you finish off. Victoria's talked a little bit about her plans to deal with the Hill Giant. and We'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see how Borok the Hill Giant goes down. Got a couple ideas. We've got... Speaking of ideas, we have some upcoming projects that we're working on. We can't give too many details quite yet, but we're very excited. Uh, to, we're going to be doing some one-shots in addition to some other tabletop content in the near future. And some things about the one-shots that we're excited to try is both new systems and new settings. And so I kind of want to talk to you about both in the past tense and in the future, what excites you, what your process is, for going into a new tabletop system or what kind of questions you ask when you're going into a new setting. And also, chat, I encourage you, and those of you who are on YouTube, comments below, let us know what you do when you first go to a new system, when you first try a new setting. What, what kind of, what gets your, what gets the motor running? Yeah, I think we might have a similar answer. Ooh! Go ahead. Because I always go straight to, like, the classes. Yeah. What classes are there? Okay. Yeah. Just read through them, see which one sounds like it's fun to play. When we were learning Pathfinder, that was quite a list. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, overwhelmingly, yeah. But it's sure. just, it's, I don't, okay. I can sit there with a rule book and go through the rules and try to read it. And it's, rule books can be dry if you don't know what you're under, like you're trying to read. So sure. Like, once right. you get an idea of what the system is, for me, it's easier to then go back. So. Yeah. I, trying to read the Pathfinder core rule book, opening to the feats page, not, it would no. be... Be rough. Yeah, it was I, rough. I, I did that. Oh, no. <laughs> I think that's why I gravitate towards kind of figuring out what class I want to play because then I can read through the class and kind of know its features and what it does and then go back to the rules and feats and see what would work with that's that. That's a great point. If you go through your class feature and you see a keyword that you don't yet know, yep. right. you can take note of that and go check that out. Mm -hmm. So you'll, if you picked a marshal, you don't have to read the spellcasting rules to start. Right. No. Yeah. Eventually you want to understand them because they're going to get used against you. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it's a very easy way to just like, you know, you look at Pathfinder and there's like almost 30 classes, I think. I th yeah, it might, somewhere around there, I think. So you go through Hundreds and you're like, feats. yeah, you've like, w short description, please. Yeah. What are, cool. do all these do? Let's narrow it down, you know. And it's kind of the same as taking a, like a smaller, I, I guess, smaller but like D, D where there's less classes where it's like okay i've got my divine casters my nature casters my arcane casters my marshals that do a couple different things taking and just like taking the system you already know and it's not i don't think a perfect idea to try to map it over because it could be very different for example bubblegum shoes you are a high school student so i wouldn't suggest necessarily fully mapping D, &D over but you can take that understanding right. that you have of games and say, okay, so this is just a D6 system. And Finding comparisons is a mm -hmm. great way to get uh, that starting knowledge. And looking at what a character sheet looks like also for me, like more than just classes, oh. but what's on that sheet? What do you put on page one? That's yeah. an excellent point. I actually had not considered mm -hmm. yeah. what does a character sheet look at? Because I often think, you know, I think in terms of DMing, and so the character sheet doesn't come up as often for me. That character sheet is going to say, uh, you know, for D&D, &D, you've got your your 
primary attributes, your strength, your int, your dex. Then you've got your class information. So maybe your weapon attacks, or if you've gone and put some of your what spell kind of attacks do on I there. See? Yeah, do I, these skill proficiencies, what skills are listed, and taking those concepts and then looking at another game says, what's important to this game? Because a lot of games have multi-page character sheets. What do they put on that front page? Huh. Yeah. That what, when we when we get a little bit closer to running these one shots, maybe we should come back and kind of do these sort of questions with the system mm -hmm. yeah. as a sort of introduction for those of you who are interested. Yeah, because that's a good idea. to me that's just the easiest way to learn any game. It's just yeah. What then, do we care about the most? And then once you've kind of built your character or what you have an idea of what your character and how you want to play it, just do a play test. I think would probably be the next step mm -hmm. and. Helping you to understand it better yeah. than just reading it. For a lot of uh, for a lot of tabletop systems, there are freely available, or uh, if you're if you're financially able to support folks, uh, there are various one shots created by the community. Oh yeah. And those one shots often are very low buy-in. Um, we be goblins is one of the a big famous one. Yeah. Uh, there's a sheep one for fifth edition that's quite fun. There's I can't remember the name of it right now, but there's this really great one. This kind of the the community answer to Lost Minds, of like here's uh -huh. another early campaign. Oh, okay. It's got slightly more mature themes. Not like you know like you can't you have to be an adult necessarily to play it, but it's more like no fate of black. Yeah, but it's it's like. It is, um, it's people saying, okay, we want to approach this game as a table full of adults who all want to kind of not just worry about the combat, but also the social issues that are happening in this community. I will go look up the name and post it. Sure. Well, it was, it was we'll very put it on the Discord. Yeah, I would love to go <laughs> play it at some point because I think it's really good, but it's another answer. And looking on Twitter, looking on the DMs Guild for people who are creating their own one shots or mini series or little campaign settings. It's great because so many people have such good ideas that you don't necessarily always get to see. Yeah, that 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 session like zero is definitely where you're gonna make your mistakes and kind of mm -hmm. learn. For sure. And test combats. Yeah. Um, when we're learning anything new, or I'm trying a new class, for example, I want to see okay, what does this character do whenever I'm in a social setting? Obviously, it's a lot of role play with some certain roles, but okay, I'm trying to do this extended combat. Maybe there's a combat and there's a chase. Either I'm running away or somebody else is running away. But running these kind of the heavy dice roll, um, to give my other example again, a bubble gum shoes, the other system that I know the rules of pretty well, is um, <laughs> it's good. the social combat, where it's not going to be that you're punching somebody, but you're like getting into a fight with like, you know, maybe the, uh, I don't know, the, a, the a, janitor, the janitor, yeah. the jock, your math <laughs> teacher, and you're arguing with them. And math. You're, yeah, I would always say the math teacher. And so <laughs> and so it's about, okay, whenever I'm in these situations where it's very reliant on dice rolls, what does that look like? And that would be where I would, if we were going to play that, I would focus my time there. I actually have one approaching a new system tip that I'd like to mention that works yeah. really well for me. And that's find someone online who's played that system. Oh, yeah, for sure. Watch a yeah. game. Um, uh, Dimension 20 has an uh, incredible cast. Uh, mm -hmm. Misfits and Magic plays an amazing 2D6 system that just, if you needed, if you were pitched this, maybe it would be hard to understand, but if you actually watch this short series of games, mm -hmm. instantly uh, confident, this is going to be a great yeah. time. Yeah, I was figuring out the role, the rules of the game as we were playing it, having never looked at the game before, because it's, it's just very like, rules light too. Yeah, it's it, the flow of the gameplay, their ability to play, their ability to understand the rules and express them to other people while just doing what they do, playing a game, was really helpful. And we've done that with other tabletop games too, where where it's like, okay, I'm interested in this. Let me go check out how other people do it. And obviously, YouTube is a great source. That's for that. how I for found sure. out about the Glass Cannon podcast. I wanted to learn about Pathfinder, and so. That's what I I searched. Hey, who's playing Pathfinder? That was that was a couple of years back now. That was pre playing the last campaign. Uh, for me, that was Hideous Laughter podcast because I was looking yeah. for specifically Pathfinder horror, and so I found Hideous Laughter. Oh man, they're great. We gotta we make a very concerted effort to mention them as often as we can. Yeah, <laughs> Hideous Laughter, Roll for Romance. Um, my dear friend Toffee, some <laughs> wonderful folks out there. If you want to watch some more games, there's plenty of content out here for you. Mm -hmm. What about, so we, what we've been talking about has mostly been about game mechanics, class building, 
the crunch, and that's super fun. We're, I love the crunch. We've got a pretty crunch-heavy part of the table, that's my especially favorite. Connor. <laughs> yeah. But also, there the are questions, yeah. and uh, Connor knows what setting that I've been, uh, the setting I've been working on. Yeah. What about a world would you want to know? What about a, a, a system? Now, we can't talk about specifics here. Right. But what, are you, what kind of questions do you ask when you're told, I have a game in a system you already know, I want you to join. What do you want to know about that world? to jump before making a character? I've got a long answer, you can go first. <laughs> um, typically, I look for, uh, like, what are the, the the class structure? Like, how is it? Are there, like, is it, like, king and queen and then everyone else below that? Or is it, like, more democratic? Like, what what is the, the, the class structure in the actual setting? Okay. That's really interesting. That can kind of draw you to it. Um, also, what is the setting theme? Like, is it high fantasy, like D and D? Is it mentioning Starfinder? Is it going to be more of like a science fiction? Yeah. Is it that low? That kind of is a big draw too. Is it in a, a is it in the current era with no yeah. magic? Right. Are, are yeah. you out pulling at pages out of Nancy Drew or low fancy like Dresden mm -hmm. Files, where it's like modern day Chicago, but also wizard yeah you know well, again that's a book is it series, a but... candy kingdom is it a candy kingdom which <laughs> yeah. again that's an important question that should be like number three maybe yeah. number two on your list of questions so i'll roll that back i'll do setting first and then like mm -hmm. what is the class system like is kind of like the first two questions mm -hmm. that i would have it would be for me the cultural analog and i don't necessarily mean that as real world cultural but there are some for example very uh eastern europe inspired for curse of strahd mm -hmm. but there's also like hey is this like have I seen a movie or a couple movies where maybe there's like some similarities? Like, have Related any... fiction is such Related an easy fiction. touchstone. Mm -hmm. Hey, and then... we're gonna play. This is kind of Star Warsy. Mm -hmm. You already have seven questions scratched off. If we do bubblegum shoes, can we do it like a Twin Peaks thing? Yes, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, you know me. Yes. You know okay. me. It's gonna be Twin awesome. Peaksy. Um, and then the other question I would ask is kind of. This comes from I've read a couple of the players' guides for. <laughs> uh, our, our dear friend Jayhawk795 asks how grounded in reality are we going and can I ride a dragon with my minotaur wife okay that's the, actually a pretty good question to answer in the world we know yes Jason yes you can ride the dragon with your minotaur <laughs> wife I love that it that is allowed it's allowed um I was gonna say so there's that cultural analogs either real world or fictional analogs you know you, you make a magic school, people are gonna draw comparisons to Harry Potter. How close to Harry Potter are you? And there's there's a lot of stigma, and I, wanted, I don't even wanna say there's, uh, stigma is the wrong word. Mm -hmm. um, stigma kind of implies the community thinks negatively of the people doing this. I think it's actually more that there are dungeon masters who have a worry that, oh no, what if I make a setting that's too derivative? And I wanna say, Screw that yeah. entirely. Do it. Do Granted, what you want. I love working on our setting. It's high fantasy. I take some things that I like from uh, different fantasy authors I like. Uh, you know, read, read some things on the recommendation of a friend. Brandon Sanderson has some great stuff that I've Beautiful. taken a little bit that I, I like this. I don't like this so much. No, I, I change things. But if you want to go and make a Harry Potter with lightsabers, do it. Yeah. It's fine. My if, you're, if you're, as long as your players are enjoying it. Yeah. My next addition to that would be the, uh, and this comes from Pathfinder actually, Pathfinder First Edition's player setting guides okay. for campaigns for their APs. Um, I really liked the, what are the com, like what is your racial and class distribution? So for example, what they say is here's like, this is a heavily human, heavily elf, heavily X, Y, or Z, you know, like. Yes, race maybe, in the D&D &D meaning. Right, right, yes, not. How many loxodons per square mile? Right, are so like in elves, we're like, oh, there's like five five loxodons or something like that, I don't know, but they're like super rare, so being a loxodon is like, you're gonna stand out. Um, and we did that during character creation, yeah. when we talked about who you were going to play. Uh, Jake was a, a very big question. Jake wanted to know how common are things, and the lower on that list you were, you were very uncommon. Yeah. You would need to justify, okay, why are you here? Right, and that's the big thing, because for me as a player building a character, if I'm going into a full elven population that's like sequestered from most of the rest of the world, and I'm playing a fire genasi, I'm gonna really stand out. There's gonna be no hiding who I am. If I am the only gnome in a city or the only human in a gnomish city, it's gonna stand out. And so knowing kind of what that society's like there, and then 
class is kind of loose. So in Pathfinder, they say, here's classes and archetypes that kind of fit with the setting if you want to match what other people are. Sure. So, Most of the time, classes work right. everywhere. But if you're playing in a... You're, you're going to be traveling through jungles and ruins, very Indiana Jones. Perhaps a, a masked vigilante with a billionaire playboy philanthropist alter ego. Correct. That's not the best option. And then again, to pull it back out of fantasy and do bubble gum shoes, because I think this is a really good way of contrasting yes. against um, the D&Ds kind of in the high fantasies go to like middle schools and high schools is going, okay, am I the only football player at a technical school for science kids who want to go into science, like STEM careers whenever they grow up? Does MIT have a football team? I don't even know, man. I don't. If they do, then I have not heard of it. I'm sorry. Uh, Victoria and okay, I are the resident team. sports ball. Yeah, I know a little bit. I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, but that's a great point. Having that contrast, uh, yeah, using bubble gum shoe there, knowing, well, what is the you know in Twin Peaks, having someone be a robotic superstar would be like a uh, prodigy would be very weird R way out of normal and that's going to be those things that draw attention to your pc because hey if i want to go into an all human city as a tiefling and they have like a thing against tieflings there there's going to be a difference between me playing as that versus me maybe being a half elf right there's going to be some differences and it's a good thing to know as a player yeah connor got to help with some world building while making thorn we had a discussion and one of the decisions i think and I hope it felt this way, ultimately ended up in your hands was, do you want Drow to be discriminated against? Do you want Drow to be this, still have the stigma that we've talked about beforehand? And in the end, they do, but you're a half Drow, and you're not going somewhere that's been recently attacked by Drow. Yeah, yeah. Drow are just kind of known to be a little shady and be a custom, like be around shady things. Yeah. So there's always the worry. It makes sense that people are like, oh, well. What if What's that drow merchant's it? actually a scout from the drow undercities? Right. right. The undercities yeah. are terrible. Oh yeah. They're, they're pretty. Bad. They're they're some they're pretty terrible because Lolth exists and the spider mother is a monster. I yeah. love her. She's my favorite. Sorry. Um, no. <laughs> I couldn't stop myself from saying that she's my favorite. It just came out. Uh, you've actually so the elven pantheon has been a very present and common mm -hmm. topic at our tables. Yeah. We've got several players who elves are one of, if not their favorite fantasy trope. Yeah. And so we've had uh, ex campaigns about elves. We've had main, uh, we've had a lot of player characters have their main story arc be about their relationship with the elven deities. Um, you oh, actually have, are the most absent from the elvenness. And even then you've still un almost unprompted brought about some pieces of how did elven culture touch on uh, touch on your character. And so, hey, if you were learning about our our, our setting, we'd ha and we don't bring up the elves, we did a bad job explaining right. it. Because everything building up to the campaign we're in now was like the second half of our campaign almost was so focused on elven culture and elven gods and elven society. And the fallout of an elven civil war was the right. impetus for the whole campa campaign. Yeah. And and that is one of those those world building pieces. And when you're building something from scratch, also thinking about those high points of history. For us, we're coming in with our high point of history being our last campaign. Now we've got this world built, we've got all these things. Our DM has done an amazing job of flushing everything out. And we're in this we're in this continent that we kind of know, kind of like in a place where we don't know, like one of our holes you went in to the our opposite knowledge. end of the continent. Right, and so we have all this familiarity, and for us, we have, as players, this is a weird thing, right? Your first time playing in a new setting versus your second time playing in that setting. Your first time, your player may, your character may know things you don't know because you grew up there, you have all this intimate knowledge, and for us, it's like, now that I've played in it for a couple of years, I've seen these things, we've helped build what happens now because this was a couple decades back. Okay, what do I know is the new question that you start asking. Can I give a concrete a example for that? In a different okay. way. Um, I will, yeah. Sorry, no, my fault. No, sorry, I just wanted to finish that out. Was like, it, at first it's like, okay, what does my character know? Because I don't know anything. Now it's like, okay, I know too much, hold me back, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really what it is now. Uh, so we have, to just give a more concrete example here, there is a location known as Mun in our setting, a massive lumbering turtle with a huge, there's a massive bazaar on top. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of, there used to be a casino slash resort 
on top of this one during turtle? Oops. Used, Used to be. <laughs> Used to be is always a bad term whenever you play. Play and the players campaign. happened. Yeah. yeah. But an, one secret that the players attempted to uncover was how do we access what is essentially a secret marketplace access through the mun itself? There's the, somewhere in the bazaar was a door leading to this, and how do we get there? In our last campaign, the players searched and solved that puzzle, but none of the PCs now would know the answer to that innately. Right. And so there's a little bit of that player knowledge, character knowledge disconnect. I might have gotten a little hint of it a couple of uh, episodes ago, but... Oh, did we? Did we have we brought up Mun? We didn't. We didn't bring up Mun, but we brought up some of the individuals from that hidden marketplace. marketplace. Oh, yeah. we, yeah. okay. You we did, did also reference last session. You did reference a turtle wandering the desert with a great city yes. on his back. You no. did Mun say itself, that. Mun is not a secret. Mun is a, right. a yeah. massive city far to the north, located within the deserts of the Twin Marshes. Yeah. That's such a weird sentence. Oh, with no it context. Is. <laughs> It's also a bit of an antiquated term, but yeah. we haven't brought it up, so we'll talk about the newer name a little bit later. I don't like any of those words <laughs> in combination with each other. Well, so before we go, because we, we're, you know, it's, it's 45 at the moment. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of interested, kind of in a player expectation. We've started this brand new chapter. You're in the big city, mm -hmm. and there's lots of changes. We're in that, you know, that large sandbox in a smaller space. Mm -hmm. And you all are, have your day two have been hi have hired yourself out as mercenaries. What's going on with this? This is I don't believe this was originally the intent for the players. How's that going? We need cash. <laughs> um, you don't want to get a payday loan. I get that. Yeah. The interest rate's atrocious. If we're going to try to figure out who's doing these paintings and killing people, I think we're going to need some cash flow. And I think mercenary works the quickest way to that. Ismini, not crazy happy about it, but this is life. Victoria, crazy happy about it. <laughs> I am so down for doing mercenary work because every time you get to explore something new, it's just fun. We're in this new city. I'm doing mercenary work for the first time really ever in a campaign. I love it. I'm... I, this is gonna be for me as a player. One of my favorite little things is like, I love quest boards. I admit, yes. I love quest boards. So the uh, one thing that the players didn't ask yeah. about was if there were other jobs available, because this one was very much time sensitive. Right. But if you decide to continue going down the mercenary band, either with the Defiant Smiles or perhaps forming a band of your own, you all could, <laughs> or you could join the league. I'm not gonna join the league. Uh, I have loyalty. But. But if you do end up continuing this, there is going to be a sort of, it's not really a mechanic, but there are missions that, that Brask will have available for money. That is so exciting. Oh, their full name, by the way, I was asked this in the Discord and didn't actually come up last session, is the League of the Triumphant. I don't like that. That sounds evil. They make a lot of money. Yeah. They make a lot of money. They're okay. very big. Evil organizations usually make a lot of money. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> What's this? Did you say capitalism bad? Is Clella here? <laughs> no. Well, so you're mer you're working as mercenaries now. Maybe a temporary situation. But uh, what are you know? Are there any? You got any any uh, any delicious tidbits of future information? Any plans going on? Well, it's now grown completely out of my control with the whole basement thing. So I don't know if I have anything to add. <laughs> you need, you do need, you'll need more money. You'll probably right. need real estate. Right. I just thought, okay, you know, we we have our wizards. They do their thing. They build these tall towers. They can move earth. Yeah. I believe that might be a divine spell, though. Must there be. are always solutions, and they have two hands and a trunk. <laughs> oh my gosh. Are you suggesting using uh, using Loxodon labor? Specifically Silas. Just or... one. <laughs> just, yeah, just, just Silas. Silas. But no. Dig a tunnel, dig, dig a tunnel. I have a problem now. I've been, I've had a problem put in front of me and it wasn't a one-off now. It's happened twice with this painting. And I want to solve it. I don't need- You're referring to its, its aura effect, right? Yes. Okay. I'm not even referring to the murders. I'm referring to the painting <laughs> itself. I want to know how this magical effect is happening. And I don't know if I have the ability yet to figure it out, but I have to know how I can figure it. I'm not even looking at him and I'm not going to look at this whenever I edit this later. Uh, 
<laughs> but I need to know, can I figure it out and what's going on? Because this is a very mass crowd control is a pretty powerful effect. Like it is not a low level spell with replicator. Right. If, if, it's, if it's copying, for example, mass suggestion for anybody who happens to look upon it, okay, let's get let's get technical here. It's not a glyph of warding because it would have fired off one time and then have been done. It's anybody who comes across it. So this is a very powerful magical effect. But you also know that it isn't necessarily a specific... It, it is a spell. It isn't one spell. It's right. a magical item with effects that are similar to several. Mm -hmm. So because it's been bound to an item, there's a little bit of changes. Right. But whenever I think about it as a player, now as me, he doesn't know all of these words either. But if, if I think <laughs> about it as a player, I need to as Victoria. So as Meanie also needs to figure this out. Is Meanie, so this is a fun player knowledge versus character knowledge. Mm -hmm. The spell suggestion is obviously something as Meanie is aware of. Oh yeah. Uh, very aware of. Very aware And of. similarly, you, you knowing that spells that exist and that affect a single person often exist in a larger form. Right. Your basic knowledge of, of wizard spells is far beyond second level. I can't learn any healing magic. There, oh. Oh no. There's a very, very small amount of options for gaining health. Vampiric touch is an option. I meant how I knew mass cure wounds last campaign. I can't learn that this you time. You do not have access to magical secrets. One of the strongest Ooh, it's hard not to say this is the strongest feature. The strongest feature in the game is spell casting. Yes. But Magical Secrets is definitely somewhere up there in the top 10. Mm -hmm. uh, Magical Secrets, for those of you who do not know, is a bardic ability that allows bards at certain levels to take a spell of their uh, a spell up to the highest spell slot. Two spells. Right. Yes. <laughs> There's no, more to, than two. Yeah, eventually. I need to know. Yeah, eventually. Multiple yes. spells at of the mm -hmm. depending on the level of the highest level you can cast from any spell list. Mm -hmm. Taking one from the bard list would be crazy. Oftentimes they'll do things like taking spells from the paladin spell list. I'm still gonna point to you for this. Yeah, you're still a, you're still a paladin in our hearts. <laughs> and be, for all of the half caster unique spells, mm -hmm. such as paladins who only get up to fifth level, those spells tend to be more powerful for their slot. Yeah, those fifth level spells sure, yeah. feel stronger than like a bard or a wizard's fifth level spells. Right, and not, and not universally, but not the, the big yeah. example that always jumps out to me is Find Greater Steed is an absurd spell. spell. It's a fourth level spell so good. that creates, the simplified version is you can create a flying pegasus. Yeah, yeah you can have a griffin, good. a pegasus, flying lions I think were a thing too. Like, just like fun stuff. Fun stuff. The flying lion. Yeah, I know. Oh I remember. my god. Atreus, I think. Adrian, Atreus. Yep. Yes. Um, so you got your once you finish your mercenary work, handle a bit of serial killing. Yep, just a little fishing trip. Not for me. I think for Silas, that'll be a thing. You'll need a big boat for Silas. Um, yeah, for for Thorn, it's like. He's got really nothing to to go off of, so I think he's just kind of going with the flow at the moment. You got your uncle's shop, who he at the it's not doing well. At the end goal for him is probably to get maybe Dunsmith back, but that's probably a little further down the line. Ooh. Victoria, out of character. Could not be more enthusiastic about I, this. I have been wanting to go there since the board was mentioned the first time. Did you, so without necessarily answering the, the follow-up, do you know what the name Dunsmith's deal is? Ismini has not been there. No, for, Victoria. Victoria, I think I have an idea of what's going on in Dunsmith. I think I have we an can, idea. We can, we can mean mug you. Give us that theory. People come for the juicy. I don't remember their names, but they were there with the castle that we brought down. They're the big guys, and we brought the castle from the sky inside of the mountain the down. The creature you're to referring to is something called a Nightbringer. I feel like there was at least one of those there. A Nightbringer, is, for those of you who may not know, is a massive, in insanely powerful, somewhere between CR 15 and 20, second creature from Shadowfell. Second They're interpretation is some bizarre warlock thing gone wrong with like some very bizarre pact breakage and like this big- This is a sorcerer, thank you. <laughs> I know that you are a sorcerer. He's a good boy. I'm saying that I don't Warlocks. think that the original intention was to create sorcerers. I think that there was some kind of eldritch abomination that exploded in Dunsmith. Those are my two thoughts. I'm gonna let you have my theories. Number That's one, very is those, think, those scary for boys. For everyone counting, I think that was three, but it's okay. I, 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 I too noticed an extra thing in there. Okay. Oh. 
Hey, uh, the you know what? Pact gone wrong Math is for blockers yeah. and counting is for nerds. Counting's for nerds. I don't yeah. know how to count. It's fine. Um, <laughs> math is for blockers. Um, that's very exciting. <laughs> I, Connor, we definitely, maybe one day after you've visited Dunsmith, we can talk a little bit about where the name uh, came from. But that's going to have to wait, I think, until the actual, once the party goes there, maybe learns a little bit more. If, that's a fun thing to have on the horizon. I Well, that's beyond the horizon at this point. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> yeah. far off from the horizon. It's, you know, a couple horizons from now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all you really know about Dunsmith is there, you know of a few people, there is at least one mage who works there mm-hmm. who had been commissioned to enchant a dagger for Lord Krivar Album of Copper's Back. We know there was a shepherd there. There was a shepherd there who ran away and explained to you that the city was gone. And Ruin. third, we did find out last session that our dear friend was from Dunsmith as well. Because he did mention it last session to the guards. Who do we have down here? I think it's a dog. <laughs> Let's get the dog. Come here. Coco, come help us sign off. Coco? Come here. <laughs> One of them is making noise. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we're all we're all unable to get Coco. Yeah, she's oh I think Coco. Got her? Nope. Yeah. Hey, come here. Everyone wants to say good, good night. Well, while Victoria is retrieving the pup, uh, I want to let you know, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's footnotes. We really appreciate your support. See this? See this Coco right here? <laughs> we uh, absolutely, uh, your subs feed her, make her grow stronger and more powerful. Perhaps one day we'll have enough of you supporting us that Coco will be big like Clifford. Oh yeah, this is a little big fluffy white dog. As always, uh, we really appreciate having you here. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you in just under two, two weeks. weeks. Good night, everybody. Oop. Hey, y'all. I didn't have my button up. <laughs> <laughs> Smile and wave. Smile and wave, boys. <laughs> <laughs>